Hello, Erdika. Mm. If you don't know what Erdika stands for, it's either I really don't know or I really do know. That's why I decided to name this podcast. I'm putting little bunny air quotes on my fingers or, you know, little peace signs that wiggle, you know, (laughs) because it's not like an official podcast. It's just, you know, me talking to my phone and then putting it, posting it on my YouTube. (laughs) Uh, Almost like a little vocal diary entry. I've decided that I'm not going to put too much pressure on myself to make a super long, like, podcast episode that's, like, 60 minutes. I'm just going to record spontaneously whenever I feel that I have the thoughts kind of collected. And, yeah, because the time that I can speak up most clearly is when my brain is activated by those thoughts. So what better time than that time, which seems to be now, what better time than that to record? So I was going to maybe name this episode Blonde on the Inside or something to that effect, but I don't know. Maybe I won't be that specific in the title, but... That's kind of the idea of like this first part that I want to record is I've kind of grown up with this idea as if I was blonde on the inside. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I don't know, but there's this stereotype in, um, I guess, Western media or Hollywood or whatever. The media that I grew up watching here in Canada, there's a stereotype of the dumb blonde or whatever, you know, one of my childhood best friends, her favorite movie was Legally Blonde, and I love that movie as well. I mean, it's a fantastic movie. Elle Woods is iconic, and it's just a fun, really feel-good, girly movie. So it really resonated with both me and that childhood friend of mine, and she was also Asian, or she still is, obviously. Um... Yeah, so even though the main character was blonde, blue-eyed, she, as a personality, really resonated. I'm like a clumsy person. Sometimes I have brain farts. (laughs) So those are kind of like the quote-unquote blonde moments that I would have. It's interesting. I don't know uh, really the theory behind all this, or if there is some sort of grand theory or not, but it's interesting that Sailor Moon, which happens to be the picture that I'm probably going to put up, it's a little drawing of Sailor Moon that I did a long time ago, Sailor Moon is also got the yellow hair, the blondness, the blonde and blue-eyedness, and of course, Sailor Moon was another character that I totally loved when I was a kid. And, you know, in the English version of Sailor Moon, she was meatball head. She was the funny, really clumsy, sometimes ditzy, kind of like blonde personality. I don't know. I don't know why there's this association with blonde girls or that blonde girls are more fun or something or that they're just so carefree and, I mean... I guess you can trace it back to Marilyn Monroe. I don't know exactly where it comes from exactly, but this is a thing. And you know that I love Barbie movies too. And so Barbie, I mean, although she's not a dumb blonde type of personality in Barbie movies, she's just the main character and she's just someone that I relate to so much and I still watch so many Barbie movies to this day and I love Barbie and we all know what Barbie looks like right (laughs) but yeah so that's kind of a weird thing where I would like think like I was like blonde on the inside of course I never you know dyed my hair ever in my life I never put blue contacts in my eyes before I've never bleached my skin white I actually 
you know, I had blonde, blue-eyed friends growing up, and I would tan with them, and then I would just get really, really dark. I don't know what I really thought. Like, maybe I thought I was a white person or something, and that I could afford to get so dark. I don't know. I mean, not that it's a bad thing to be so dark. I don't even know. See, look. I am just kind of going off on this random thing. Um, but yeah, that was something I just did, because white girls liked tanning and I liked tanning too I guess even though I was already kind of tan well I mean I don't know to be honest I wasn't actually that tan like as a baby with my baby skin originally like my skin shade was not that tan but definitely the Taiwan side of my family did get pretty dark my Akon, my Taiwanese grandpa, he was super uh, dark for an East Asian person. And, and not that there's anything bad about that. But I'm just saying, I never like drew myself as a blonde or like tried to make myself blonde. It's like when I drew pictures of myself when I was five, I still drew myself with dark hair and dark eyes. So where am I going with all this? <laughs> I don't really know where I'm going. It's just something interesting. Like, I wonder why Sailor Moon, which is a Japanese anime, has those coloring pairs. Like, the pair of blondness with blue eyes. Maybe they thought it was more marketable. Maybe they thought it would be more international. And, I mean, it does look good. Yellow and blue look good together. Sure. And I, I think I read somewhere that the illustrator who made Sailor Moon made... Uh, originally wanted the Sailor Moon to be pink-haired with pink eyes, which is what they made for Sailor Mini Moon after. Um, but Sailor Moon was also supposed to look like that. So there's this, like weird correlation with, I don't know, pink and blonde and blue eyes. I don't know. It's just something interesting, and I would love to read some sort of film theory article that dissects these intersections. I don't know what to call it. <clears throat> yeah, so I don't know why they made Sailor Moon to look like that. It might have just been they thought it would be more appealing because it was, I guess, a standard of beauty in Hollywood. I know there are a lot of Asian girls who experiment with dyeing their hair or color contacts or skin bleaching even. And I don't think that that's wrong. It's, it's interesting to, to explore these things. I can understand that because of the world we live in, these are things that interest people. Because really what you see in the media really does shape and influence you subconsciously, your perspective even if you don't really, like, know why. And it's natural. I kind of think that everybody, if they were in each other's shoes, would likely do the same things. Like, we're all really more the same than we are, the, than we are different. That's why acting was so appealing to me, because I think if you were born as someone else, and you experienced every single thing that they experienced, you would probably be them because you're so shaped by your environment, by your genetics, by your et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The way you think influences the decisions you make, and the way you think is influenced by your life and your, your identity and everything surrounding that, all the circumstances of your life. So yeah, I don't have some sort of great um, eureka or 
what is the word? What is that word? I don't have some sort of enlightening point that I'm trying to make. It's just an observation that I made about myself. And I think it really supports how important representation is because what you see influences what you think about yourself and what you think about the world. Now, I'm Christian and growing up with my mom, she's a pretty strict Christian. Body modification was never really... I mean, I guess it was unspoken, but discouraged, you know? Like, it's not like she's dyed her hair or permed her hair or done those things. Um, she used to have her ears pierced, but she got her piercings are gone now. Like, her earlobes have now grown over that whole... <laughs> But yeah, so me and my younger sister Joyce, we never got our ears pierced. We never have had our hair dyed. And that's that. I mean, my sister got glasses when she was a kid because my sister was born three months premature. So she's a miracle. Like, it's a miracle that she's alive. And she, I think because of the prematurity of her birth, her eyesight was not that good from the get-go. So she got glasses as a kid. And that's about the only body modification. <laughs> I mean, that's not really a body modification. It's just like a, an eyesight enhancing tool. <laughs> um, yeah, we never really had any kind of exposure to that and my mom was very not into the whole nail polish makeup thing when I started using makeup and nail polish she was not that happy about it let's just say that like I would get up like two hours before going to school like middle school or high school and my mom would be like stop doing that but now, guess what? My makeup skills are really good. Like, I think I'm pretty good at doing makeup on myself. And it helps when you are an actor to be good at doing your own makeup, I would say. So, um, hopefully I'm proving her wrong about her bias against makeup. I don't know. I mean, she still doesn't like makeup. <laughs> but the reason that I got into makeup at a really early age, like 10 years old, was because I had severe acne for literally like more than half of my entire life, which was not good. It was not a good time. It was a very, very bad time. Yeah, so that's why I basically, I felt like I had no choice but to put on makeup. Let's be real. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror unless I had makeup on. Let's be real about that too. That's what acne can do to you. Oh, the words that I was thinking of earlier but couldn't think of was the words profound and epiphany. Yeah, I don't have any sort of profound epiphanies to really make in Urtica, or at least I don't think I do. It's just a string of run-on sentences. <laughs> And it's a discussion or conversation starter. Like, if you jujubes have anything you've observed that you want to say that has to do with anything I'm saying, I would love to encourage that conversation and that discussion in the comments. Yeah, I know this is going to be all over the place and I'm going to be rambling, but that's just how this goes. <laughs> that's how Julie Tao is. <laughs> Also, I feel like I've pronounced my last name wrong. I asked my dad the other day, like, how do you pronounce Tao? And he was like, Tao, which is how you say it in Chinese. I mean, der. But for some reason in my whole life, I just copied how my white teachers said it. And I just said Julie Tao, not Julie Tao. And uh, <laughs> that will be a habit that uh, is very difficult 
to break, but, you know, maybe one day I'll get there. That's an aside. Okay, so back to what I was about to say. I was about to say, my mom, she had this lazy eyelid that would go and it would, like, cover her eyesight so she couldn't see out of that eye because that's how intense her her eyelid drooped. Like, it would droop in front of her pupil so she couldn't see. So she got double eyelid surgery when she was young to fix that. The whole topic of cosmetic surgery and plastic surgery and body modification, it really interests me because it's, you know, oftentimes related to self-image, identity, and self-image, and identity are also topics that interest me. So I guess that's why I decided to talk about Sailor Moon. (laughs) Sailor Moon, meatball head, is a cancer sun sign. She's a crybaby. She gets scared. She's wimpy. She eats a lot. She loves food. She loves eating food. Very, very cancerian traits. And I'm a cancer sun sign too. So that's great. The uh, relatability is high. And because I saw all these like outward reflections of what I really related to, and they were all embodied by these blonde, blue-eyed, light-skinned images. That's how the concept of being blonde on the inside came to be a descriptor that I gave myself. Interesting, right? Now, let's talk about the closest I ever got to doing something that could be called, like, a, I don't know, a procedure. And that is acne scar removal. (laughs) I became pretty close. Or is it became? I don't know. I came pretty close to getting acne scar removal. I used to be really, really insecure about these craters in my face because I would look on screen and it would be like a macro image of my face and my facial skin and there would be all these dots, all these crevices, all these acne scars, atropic acne scars that were indented and because they're indented there would be shadows or I don't know but the light just does not look flattering on acne scars especially Because, like, in film or in cinematography, sometimes the light is dramatic, you know? You want those shadows. You want those very dramatic um, lighting effects. And that would not look good on skin that has craters in it. (laughs) Especially if it's a macro shot. So I was... I used to be a little bit self-conscious about my acne scars. And I went for a consultation with this dermatologist or I'm not sure if he was a dermatologist actually (laughs) well I had to get a referral from my dermatologist in order to see another man who does basically laser or acne scar lasers or whatever and I forgot that doctor's name that his name was maybe it was Jason or something but I really appreciated the consultation that I had with him. It was a free consultation. He's a a, a doctor in Vancouver. He does lasers. I don't know what, what his actual official title is. The way he discouraged me from getting laser treatment. Oh, just marvelous. It's so cool how, you know, that's how he makes his money, yet he was telling a potential customer who would maybe pay, you know, stupidly pay. (laughs) I mean, maybe it's not stupid, but, you know, it was just a concern I had out of just pure insecurity, obviously. And if I were to get laser treatment or something, it would have been thousands. And did I have thousands? No. (laughs) I am, I was, I am still in debt, student loan debt. Yeah, anyway, he was very discouraging of me getting anything to reduce my acne scars. 
I told him, I'm an actor, I care about this, da 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 And he said, your acne scars are shallow, they're hardly noticeable, the only thing I notice is your dog bite scar, you know, I have that dog bite scar on my cheek, which I love my dog bite scar, actually. I actually think my dog bite scar is cute, so I would not want to laser that away. What I wanted to laser away was the acne scars, because I, to be honest, I was ashamed that I had acne. Because there's such a big stigma around acne. People think that you have poor hygiene if you have acne. People think that you eat poorly if you have acne. People think that your genetics are just inferior if you have acne. And all of that just correlates to them thinking that you are just inferior if you have acne. No, really. That's at least how I saw it. Um... So in that time of my life, I was probably 18 or 19, that's a consultation that I went to, and he, God bless him, told me not to go through with it. He said my acne scars were shallow and that they were hardly noticeable. Of course, I noticed them a lot, but now as I've aged more and more, I mean, I still do notice them, but I just don't care anymore. It's not like the number one thing I care about anymore. Insecurities, they change. They're fleeting. One year you might notice your nose a lot, or the next year you'll notice your your something else a lot, you know? I used to also be really insecure about my Becker's Nevis, which is a... it's similar to a birthmark, but it's on my uh, shoulder, and I would just avoid wearing any sort of tops that showed showed my shoulders because I had this mark there and that mark was not there when I was born for the first 12 years of my life I didn't have that mark it only showed up after puberty and the hormonal changes that came with puberty so I didn't really feel like it was part of my body first of all and then and then it became like part of my body anyway now it's fine Now I feel like I can finally say I accept. It is like my little Australia-shaped birthmark, continent-shaped birthmark type thing. It's like a tattoo that I didn't ask for. (laughs) And it's unique, and that's nice. Of course, there are other things that I have insecurities about now that have taken over (laughs) you know, every, but as I said, I feel like every year as you progress, your insecurities change and, and you evolve and there's different things that you focus on. There's different things that you prioritize. There's different things that you find importance in. So maybe right now I feel insecure about so-and-so, but in five years I won't. And this is just in my experience. I can't say I know what it's like for other people. Some people fixate on things a lot more than maybe I do. I mean, when I did have severe acne, that was my number one fixation for sure. And now that that's gone temporarily, I am so happy. (laughs) Like, do you know what it's like to be able to touch your face and not feel pain It's great. (laughs) I really thought that that would never come. Like, I would never get over or cure my my acne. And so every day that I don't have it, it's like I am literally a ball of joy. It's funny. So I just took a break from recording and I listened to Olivia Rodrigo's song, Driver's License, which is all the rage right now. It was my first time listening to it and... Uh, In the lyrics, she talks about there's this blonde older girl who embodies every, all the insecurities she has, and Olivia is beautiful. I mean, yeah. Anyway, that's just kind of funny because I was literally just talking about this, so (laughs) that is really interesting. God knew what I was recording today. (laughs) But moving on from the blonde thing, 
another interesting thing kind of about my upbringing is I, the whole Christianity, the Asian Christian community type thing, but I didn't really have Asian Christian friends, you know, despite living in a province that has a lot of Asians, like, you know, the population of Asians is large here in BC. Despite that, I didn't have Asian friends. Um, I had, like, you know, white Christian friends, and but not, like, full Asian Christian friends. I didn't have that sort of, like, Asian Christian community at all. And even though I went to a high school where it was, like, 90% Asian, literally, I didn't have friends. I still felt like an outcast because of... I think, I don't know, because I'm a weirdo, I don't know. I mean, being diagnosed with bipolar when I was 16 also probably contributed to be, me being a loner, but that's kind of another tale. I would say there wasn't a lot of Christians at my school, first and foremost, and BC, the province, is actually one of the, actually it's probably the least Christian province in Canada in terms of um, demographics, or is that the word, demographics? Yeah, so that's really interesting to be kind of like a religious minority in a way, or at least that's how I kind of felt growing up. Um, And Even though I loved acting, um, I didn't have, you know, other Asian actor friends, and I loved taking film and TV acting classes and everything, but I was afraid, almost, of theater. Like, musical theater, theater, all of that, it was like I couldn't fit in with them because they were intimidating to me because... I just felt like a misfit. I don't know, I felt like different because most of the theater, musical theater types are white and they're mostly from middle class or something, I don't know, a higher class of income, I guess, than my family. So I never felt like I could truly belong there, but with film and TV, that's where I found a home. Yeah, very interesting path, I guess. And it's not like I grew up with only watching white people on on TV. I also watched Taiwan shows, like there's this Chinese Taiwan show called Suhua, which I watched with my mom when I was little, and other Mandarin shows that I would watch when I was younger. You know, the beauty standard in China or in Taiwan isn't actually blonde hair. I mean, there's no actors in any Chinese drama that have blonde hair. Everyone who's considered beautiful over there has pale skin and black hair. The more black your hair, the healthier you're supposed to be. So my mom was actually bullied when she was a kid because she had golden hair. They called her golden haired child or something. That's like the name that they used to tease her with uh, Jing, Jing Tofa, I guess, because her hair was very light brown, and it looked gold in the sunlight, which was a bad thing, because it meant that she was poor and malnourished, because if you were properly nourished, then you would have dark, luscious, shiny black hair that showed that you had all the right nutrients and stuff. Yeah, so this is, like, all very, hmm... I don't really have anything to say to this, except, hmm, (laughs) just picture the uh, emoji with the little hand on its chin. I inherited, like, my mom's, like, light hair, like, sometimes in certain lighting, my hair does look pretty light. It's all about lighting, guys. (laughs) Lighting changes everything. (laughs) Even for audition self-tapes, the lighting makes a huge difference, and... The color balance 
so sometimes I actually change the color balance of my camera. If I feel like a certain character looks a bit more white or pale, I will change the color balance to make it colder so that I look more pale. And if I feel like that character is tan, I will actually change the color balance and make myself tanner. I mean, this is just something that I did recently, just for fun to see, you know. Acting and film is so visual, so you want to really bring that character to life. And if that character's from sunny California, they might be tanner. So that is a consideration that I don't overlook. So all this to say, what is blonde? I guess that's going to be the title of this. I really don't really know. <laughs> oh wait, that's the title of the podcast. Oh my god, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> that's a little thing that someone from Big Brother 8 said. I guess I'll wrap up this, um, what should I call it, an episode? I'll wrap up this episode here. There was another topic that I wanted to get into, but for some reason I don't remember what it was. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come to me someday. I should write it down next time it comes to me. Yeah, so this is Julie Tal <laughs> signing off. See you next time, or I guess, yeah, I will, s no, wait, what? You'll see me next time, because I'll probably be on camera in my next YouTube video. So you'll see me next time. Shatsu Jin Hongzhou.